So uh, welcome back. Our next speaker is Karl Meinecke. Karl did his PhD at the University of Leeds and has been working on very interesting topics such as uh, formal specification uh, in general, very broadly, and uh, also uh, recently of hybrid systems. Uh, and in addition to formal specification, uh, also testing and machine learning. Uh, I also found out that Carl worked on universal algebras uh, as well. Uh, so a lot of really interesting uh, things. Uh, and now Carl is a professor at uh, KTH in Stockholm. Welcome, Carl. Thank you. So good afternoon, everybody. Here is my uh, talk. Let me try to mark the time a bit. Um, Cyber-physical systems. I think I work on cyber-physical systems because I do quite a lot of work with the automotive industry and I've done a little bit with avionics, but not too much that I want to shout out about. But uh, I think you won't get too far in the automotive industry nowadays, in particular with the software side of that story, without really looking at systems that are very similar to the ones we've seen here this morning. So I will talk about everything from uh, individual ECUs inside vehicles, controlling brakes, uh, backup steering and so on, all the way up to uh, the cutting edge here is really systems of systems, which is things like platoons. Uh, and using, we want to study these things using machine learning and there are various reasons for that. I should point out we've been doing this a long time. I wrote the first paper in this subject in 2004 and I would say the stuff that I'm going to talk about in the next few days uh, we've been doing since 2010. It is not deep learning. There are very important reasons why it's not deep learning, uh, but it is definitely machine learning and it follows some paradigms in uh, something called automata learning that have been around since the 1980s. So in the next three days, that's Monday, today, Tuesday and Wednesday, uh, I have planned three talks. First of all, I'm going to talk about, I'm a, these days mostly a testing person have been for some time. Before that I was a formal methods and a little bit of a theorem proving person. So uh, yeah, I've been around in different subjects as I had said since, uh, since some years now. Uh, I got interested in this idea because I was interested in testing. Testing is mostly manual. Uh, I had the question, first of all, can you apply formal methods in testing? A lot of people thought about that. And then I thought about, well, can you apply machine learning? And why the heck would you want to apply machine learning? Well, because testing is mostly a manual process in most parts of the world today. The question is whether you could automate that manual process and could a machine learning algorithm actually do something in the automation. Uh, if you look at something called active machine learning, where machine learning divides along those sides, we have passive and we have active. Uh, a lot of work today is passive machine learning where somebody gives you a data set and you do the best you can with it. But there are also active machine learning algorithms where the learners themselves are able to pose questions. And if you're able to pose intelligent questions, you're not very much different from what a manual tester does today. So this is an interesting observation to work on. So we worked on this paradigm for some years. I think it's a general paradigm uh, in the sense that it applies to uh, many kinds of models, many kinds of learning algorithms for those models. Uh, and we use model checking a lot because we're interested in formal requirements, as was pointed out. Uh, and then many model checkers, okay? So it, it's a combination of multiple dimensions. And of course, everything depends on, well, what kind of system are you trying to test to begin with? So in our work, we're generally mostly interested in embedded systems that you could model as automata somehow. Uh, and, and these are typically found in the cyber-physical world, what we used to call embedded in the older days. Uh, so there are many ways that you could sort of introduce this subject learning based testing but I'll try to be a bit concrete and, and present it through a tool because then you can actually see what the tool does and it becomes much clearer what's going on. In tomorrow's talk I want to talk about uh, a somewhat more theoretical approach to the underlying machine learning algorithms. I want to present one which is a, uh, a paradigm in our world and from which you know, various refinements can be added. So this is really automata learning, active automata learning. Tomorrow we look at an algorithm called the L-star algorithm. 
where actually you see so many of the phenomena already that it's, it's pedagogically quite good. I'm not sure I'd use it uh, in practice, but uh, you know, it's a good big place to begin for learners. And then on Wednesday, uh, I want to show you a bit more applied, uh, particularly looking at quite complex systems, systems of systems, in fact. We've been looking a lot at platooning algorithms in a project that I'm involved with. Uh, where we use simulators to do things that would be just simply too dangerous to do in the real world. So we can do them in a, the virtual world and we can, for example, um, not only do uh, a qualitative study of systems like basically you know, testing does a certain safety or liveness property hold, but we can even do quantitative studies. So we can find numerical parameters where safety suddenly breaks down because you're pushing a system too hard in the sense of trying to tune it, and you tune it too hard, you overtune it, and you lose the safety. So these are the, uh, the plans for the next three days, and let's get into to today's talk. There's a lot of material here. As you can imagine, you build up a lot of material if, if you've worked on something for, for 10 years. So I'll start with this paradigm then, learning-based testing. I won't introduce it in full generality. I'll leave your imagination to think what the alternatives could be. Uh, and I'm going to talk about a very specific tool. And when you talk about a tool, of course, you, you hardwire certain parameters that don't necessarily always have to be like that. But we live with it because it's sort of pedagogically reasonable. So I want to start off talking about what is this paradigm of learning-based testing. And, and I'll show you a short film clip of the tool in action to give you a sense of you know, what really happens. Uh, and then I think the big question mark here is, well, what the heck can you do with this kind of paradigm? You know, can you solve any interesting problems? So I'll show you a number of case studies that I think will convince you that we are definitely in the world of cyber physical systems. There is fairly little continuous mathematics in this approach. You could say essentially none. It, the machine learning is all symbolic machine learning. Okay? We've made some attempts to push continuous mathematics into that, but um, in general machine learning is data hungry and, and if you try to sort of machine learn a, a hybrid automata, which is certainly a perfectly valid kind of automata, uh, our earliest experiments have suggested that's a bit too data hungry for solving real problems, okay? And we're actually very, well, all these examples that I'm going to show you here, these are our real uh, software systems out uh, either in Volvo, these examples here, these examples come from uh, Scania. So these are genuine examples from the real world. And, and for me, it makes a big difference, you know, if you're allowed to invent your own case studies or if somebody gives, just dumps one on your desk and says, here, fix this. So it, it's much more realistic to have these things dumped on you and you do the best you can, right? There's a lot of papers and a lot of big bibliography. Here are some references. I'll try by the end of the talk to build out a bibliography. Right, so what is this about? Well, um, if you're a testing kind of person, you'll be familiar with the phrase model-based testing. And in general, we've seen a lot of models here already today. The hybrid automata is certainly one well known to all of you here. There are other kinds of, of automata models in general. We can have probabilities, we can have non-determinism, we can have you know, continuous behaviors and so on. So the automata model is really a family of models, starting with good old DFA. Uh, and, and these are fine, you know, there's so much tool construction around those things. There's sort of fixed points in the landscape. But there's a problem when you go out to industry, and that is that, that even though model-based testing was quite well hyped, I think it's gone sort of, it's peaked in the hype curve now, it's coming back down. Uh, but there are a lot of difficulties in using model-based development and not all companies are doing it, not all companies have got it to work. Some companies are actually withdrawing from that now. I think in particular a lot of companies want to go agile. And when you go agile, you're faced with a problem that how are you going to find the resources to develop the code base on the one hand and the models on the other? So this doesn't always pan out economically or, or politically. I don't know what the future will bring, but that's certainly how it is right now in, in parts of the industry. So there's a lot of pressure to be agile, to be responsive, and so on. Um, model construction, I think, is also, I, I appreciate it on the level of an ECU, 
But when you think that a modern truck is like 70 to 100 ECUs, are you really going to maintain all those models? And how are you going to combine them into a global picture? It's not so easy, right? You only need one of those models to be out of sync with the others. And, and all your conclusions can fly out of the window. So um, not sure about the scalability, but this, this is definitely an issue. On the other hand, you know, there are great things you can do when you have models but you should not underestimate the difficulty of constructing them in industry, and not only that, but maintaining them in sync with the code base, right? In general, there are other issues, you know, vehicle companies nowadays, they're really into platform integrators. They buy in lots of products. They're not going to find out what the models are because these are protected by IPRs. So nobody's going to give you a complete set of models, typically, because you'll have third-party components. So what is one to, to do about this? Well, why not try to infer models using machine learning? Is that possible? What kind of models do you get? Can you use these models for anything useful? It depends very much on the ML technology that you have in mind. But we have a question here. So this is a kind of a general question. So can we implement requirements testing, as I said, which is still today a manual process in most companies in the world, can you automate that in some efficient way? And can you use machine learning somehow? And if you can use machine learning even to reverse engineer simple models of, say, a one individual ECU, can you scale this up to, let's say, multi-ECU combinations, which is the reality of a one vehicle, let alone several in a platoon? OK, so we started thinking about an idea some years ago. And as I say, I had a formal maths background, so I was very much interested in requirements testing. And there's no end of glass box testing techniques in this world, but there's a tremendous dearth of black box testing methods. So in general, if you open a book on testing, take a book like Ammon and Offit, which is, I think, one of the sort of best academic books, you will not see a lot of guidance in there on how to do black box testing, because what structures can you use to guide yourself with? So, so we got interested in, in this for history and this because there was sort of a gap in the literature and this because we were thinking about ML. So the idea is pretty simple. We're going to integrate machine learners with classical static analysis techniques such as model checkers. And the idea is not hard to explain really. Instead of throwing test cases in the bin, whether they pass or whether they fail, which is their... their common status, or you don't throw them in the bin, but maybe you keep them as a regression test suite, but you don't do anything active with them. So why not take these test cases and use them to try to synthesize a model? And it turns out you can do this. This is often uh, surprising for, for many researchers, but the, the knowledge about it, as I said, has been around since the 1980s. So one can do this. If you can generate a reasonably large throughput of test cases, you can, in a sense, glue them. I'll be more precise what I mean tomorrow. But you can, in a sense, glue them all together or patch them together in a consistent way. You can build an automata. Okay? Uh, in particular, you can do that in a passive style, which has been, I think, known about since possibly as early as the 1950s. Uh, or you can do it in an active style, which came in in the 80s. And the active style is very interesting because in the active style of machine learning, as I said before, the machine learning algorithm itself generates questions. And it generates them using some rather efficient heuristics. And in fact, if you were to compare these heuristics with, let's say, random testing, you would quickly realize that no one ever learned an automata with a random test suite, OK? It, it's painfully slow. So the breakthrough here was the realization that you can go from uh, from NP-hard passive learning algorithms to polynomial time active learning algorithms. And as somebody said uh, this morning, I think once you're in polynomial time, you're kind of in business, right? Kind of in business. So we reverse engineer models through machine learning. That has some advantages. If you can do it fast enough, you can almost do it live, OK? You can certainly do it overnight from the latest build so that you can have a fresh model an accurate model ready by tomorrow morning. And you know it will be in sync with the code. So you sort of free up the hands 
of the poor people that had to revise models that night. Uh, and then we can use the static analysis to evaluate the learned model against a bunch of software requirements. So that we sometimes call this model-based testing without a model. It's not too ironic, that statement. There's a certain truth to it. So, um, after having looked at this generic idea in various incarnations over the years, um, I think we found the greatest industrial interest when we started looking at uh, inference of automata models uh, that you could apply to embedded software. So then our work really took off and gained industrial interest. So we've built this tool over the years, LBTest. LBTest does three things. So it more or less completely automates the testing activity. It generates the test cases themselves, and it does this through, as I said, active machine learning. It executes the tests. You have to build a test harness around the system that you're testing. The system you're testing is a black box, so you don't need to know anything about what's in there. You just need to know the API. Uh, this is done on the fly. It's all, and therefore, it's sometimes called online testing. So we don't build a test suite, run it, and look at the results. We dynamically generate new tests on the basis of the outcome of previous tests. So this is quite a useful thing because you get into self, you can get into self-optimizing loops here, where the test cases become, in a sense, better and better. Okay, based on the knowledge that you already have about the state space. Um, and we want and have to do the verdict construction. We can do the verdict construction because we're using model checkers and we're using formal requirements in, say, temporal logic. We need to do the verdict construction automatically because uh, we're in a world where we can get through one to three million test cases in a number of hours. There's no way manually you're going to make the verdicts for three million test cases, okay? It simply won't happen. So we, we want to and we have to, okay? Then we get quite high state space coverage reasonably quickly. Uh, we can also measure the convergence of the models. In other words, how accurately the, mod the accuracy of the model in comparison with the system under test. There we use uh, stochastic equivalence checking and that brings us very quickly to an area of machine learning called PAC, the PAC learning paradigm, probably, probably approximately correct. Uh, let me show you, uh, let me get out of here and show you the tool in action. I'll maybe sit down to do this uh, because it will concretize a lot of the uh, things I've been saying. This is the tool. Uh, we're going to load in some LTL requirements. Then we're simply going to hit the testing button. Uh, this will log the behavior of the, the whole software tool. But out here we'll see a number of results. And basically what's going to happen is we're going to build up an automata model iteratively, iteratively over time, okay? So we'll start with an initial hypothesis. We'll model check it. We'll try to find some bugs. We'll evaluate if those are true negatives or false negatives. Whichever it is, it doesn't matter because um, they will refine the model automatically. So we'll see a model growing and being refined over time. And it's refined by three processes. It's refined by active machine learning, which does most of the work. It's refined by the model checker, which makes hypotheses about the correctness of the model that may or may not be correct. It's also refined by the equivalence checker, when all else fails, you could say. So let me run this film clip. So I have to go out and load in a configuration file, and the configuration file sets up the job. And in this case, the job will be to test a break-by-wire system that we got from Volvo many years ago. And it's a fairly small system, so it runs quite fast in the tool, even with, uh, even with very simple learning algorithms. There's an LTL requirement. It says always, if you're breaking right now, and that the movement is above a certain minimal threshold of velocity, and if one of the wheels indicates that it's slipping, this is the rear right wheel here, is slipping, then very quickly we should release the brake request on that wheel. In fact, you should move that brake torque request onto the other wheels if you want to uh, sort of maximize your deceleration. So there, that's loaded in. 
we simply have to start testing now and there's nothing more to be done. And over here we see each row is a fresh generation of a model, okay? This is incremental, so each model refines the one before. We started with 54 states, this will stop any moment now, at 94 states. There are a bunch of verdicts out here, these basically come from the model checker. This is a failed test case here, so it, it's, it's a, an instance where the system definitely does not meet this timing requirement, and we can pull out, this is a sequence of input vectors over time, okay, that drive the system to display this error. And there's not much more to do. So what you would do uh, afterwards with this kind of tool is, is send back the failed test cases to the developers and let them sort it out, which is the traditional role of a tester. Testers have not historically been asked to fix bugs. They're mainly asked to um, notify of their existence. So the architecture of the tool then looks like this. There are three main components. There's the system under test. And it's a black box, we can't see in there. Of course, we must be told the API, otherwise we can't even talk to it. But we can fire in test cases as sequences of assignments of concrete data values to certain key input variables. And then we can observe key output variables, we just project them out. And the inputs, the input test cases will initially, and for the most part, come from an active learning algorithm, okay, an automaton learning algorithm. So using its own heuristics, it will construct these things and fire them in. This communication wrapper has to sort of concretize them because these are, are symbolic values, these must be translated to concrete values and then loaded in as a certain amount of scheduling goes on here. Uh, and then the communication wrapper has to know when to read out the, the output variables, map them back symbolically and pass them in here. So by getting access to the input sequences and the output sequences, you can build up the model. And every now and then, depending on how you design your algorithm here, you can sort of refresh the model and it will be a bit bigger. Okay? So these model abstractions, it, it's a sequence, M0, M1, M2. In fact, each row we saw in that film was a new model. Okay? So each row was an MI. So these are models are, are passed into the model checker. Uh, we work with new SMV, which is quite fine, it's quite fast enough. We accumulated in that film, see that was, that was, I was showing you that film in real time, okay? It's not speeded up in any way. So, um, you know, the, the overheads of, of learning and model checking are sufficiently slow, uh, fast, I mean, the overheads are low enough, the algorithms are fast enough, said differently, that you can do this in, you know, somewhat real time, okay? Somewhat real time. So, um, so there are two loops, okay? There's an inner loop where you're refreshing the model or building out the model. And then there's an outer loop where you do the model analysis. You generate a counterexample. We use uh, LTL or PLTL a lot because it, it's kind of the temporal logic that corresponds best to black box requirements. And it has the nice property that the counterexamples are linear uh, and therefore you can map them back into test cases very easily, okay? So when a counterexample is found here, it's a negative, but you don't know if it's a true or a false negative at that point, okay? It would be, um, if it's a false negative, it could be an artifact of the fact that you've not finished learning here, okay? This does happen. But you can filter that. The model checker makes a predict, so how does the verdict construction work? The model checker makes a prediction of the output behavior, okay? prediction. It says that if you go, go along this trajectory in the state space, you will see these behaviors. This breaks your requirement. So you, you predict the behaviors. So I can compare the observed behavior against the predicted behavior. And if they're identical, that is definitely, definitely a true negative, okay? Otherwise, we reject it. You might say, does that mean it passes through the, the sieve at that point? No, it doesn't because it's, it will stay in the model anyway. Uh, and come out later on. So there are soundness and completeness results around this technique. These are related to uh, facts like for many automata learning algorithms we can prove convergence. Already uh, Anglouin's paper, the eight, 1987 paper I think it was with L star, had a proof of convergence. So this is not like deep learning for example, 
there are typically not proofs of convergence for many of the numerical algorithms. So they can get stuck in local minima. Nothing one can do. So there are no local minima involved here. You, this is, these are guaranteed to converge. And these can be decidable problems down here. And when you put the two together, you get some you know, proofs of soundness and completeness. So um, I hope I've said enough by now that you can uh, have insight into some of the advantages of these things. Because we're able to generate models on the fly, and because the model corresponds with the data set, and this is an important point. There's a lot of discussion right now about explainable AI, okay? How can you motivate the results of, for example, deep learning? Well, you can't. There's a lot of statistical smoothing that goes on in, in many parts of machine learning where you sort of throw away the evidence, okay? Or you wait it out. And it's just gone at that point. In automata learning, this does not happen. In automata learning, I sometimes say it's what, what you get is what you see, okay? So when you look at the automata model at any time, you can explain completely all of its structural features in terms of the data set. So it, it corresponds to, it's not well defined what explainable AI means, it's more a sort of a social definition. But it is, these are explainable models, okay? So we run these algorithms and we can run them again, we can run them fairly fast in a lot of situations. Uh, and, and that's quite uh, consistent, I would say, with the principles of agile development. The models are synchronized to the actual code. They reflect what you've seen about the code. We filter out the, the false negatives. Um, oh, yes, I wanted to say, yeah, we, we have actually done some model-based testing in the past with companies. Now, one of the chief problems we found here was that you get false negatives and false positives creeping in in model-based testing. It's sort of hard to keep them outside the wall. Uh, uh, but, you know, by refreshing the model, we think we can avoid this here. And then we avoid, obviously, the, the, the manual construction of models, but also the manual construction of test cases. We have used, over the years, a number of off-the-shelf algorithms. The L-star algorithm is to do with uh, DFA learning. Well, there are not many systems in the world that have a, um, a zero or one output. You more or less only see it in formal language theory. And you don't see much formal language theory inside a truck. So that one has to generalize the sort of I.O. behaviors a bit here. Uh, the algorithms, I'll, I'll show you tomorrow L-star, and, and one can quickly explain what L-star mealy is. So this is a, a, a general algorithm for learning an arbitrary uh, mealy machine with a finite input alphabet, a finite M input alphabet, and a finite N output alphabet, OK? Which maps onto uh, a number of systems if you allow yourself to do some data abstraction. And then we've looked at our own algorithms. There have been a lot of contributions in this area now in terms of generally people want to go faster and they want to have a smaller um, footprint in terms of the number of queries, okay? So you want to build the biggest possible model for the smallest possible query set. So there are various ideas. It's, it's quite a, I won't say big, but it is somewhat big. It's certainly a lot bigger than it was um, 10 or 20 years ago as an, an area. And it's being actively researched by a number of groups in, in Europe. Perhaps you already know some of them yourselves. Um, and then the model checkers. Of course, we can swap in and swap out model checkers. We are very, have been very happy users of new SMV. We started looking at the new XMV. We're slightly less happy users of the new XMV, but perhaps they will uh, surprise us. Uh, in a positive way in the near future. So I think this is very recent uh, work, and we're, we're just starting to take account of it now. And lastly, uh, there are some choices around the equivalence checker, believe it or not. So some things to say here. Some of these things you may know uh, a lot about already, perhaps even more than me. Uh, in fact, I have a very little sense of the mix of this audience. Um, Modeling requirements, we thought that when we started this work, I've been working with formal methods ever since my PhD in one direction or another. Uh, and we, it, I think a perennial question for me over my career, I'm now nearly 57 and I've seen formal methods, I think, since my 20s. 
And the perennial question is, you know, being, well, when are they really going to carry on, to, to catch on? And um, for many people, the barrier was the modeling languages themselves. And we thought, oh my god, you know, we're going to go work with Scania next week. And they like machine learning because it's sort of buzzy. And they don't know what model checking is, but it's automated, so that doesn't matter anyway. But heck, we've got to get requirements out of them. We've got to get requirements for a brake controller or a steering controller or a fuel level display. Well, who the heck knows what that is? Is there anyone in Scania that's an expert on LTL? Scania's about 25,000 employees, right? I think there's probably not even one that one could call an expert on, on temporal logic, okay? So how the heck are we going to get this applied industrially? So we thought this was a major difficulty. I, th I think it's not. I think it simply isn't. I think for the level of complexity of requirements that we're looking at, this is no big issue. Not, not in my experience. If you have other experiences, I'm interested to know. So um, what's clear to talk about embedded and real-time systems is you need a time concept. Okay, as I said, for technical reasons, we like the linear temporal logic. To get fast model checking, well, let's do it propositionally. What that means is, is that, well, really, you would like first-order LTL, okay? Really, you would. Let's be honest about it. But that's too much to ask. But you can push a lot of the things that you'd like to have evaluated on the data types. You can push those into the wrapper so that you can sort of hide the, the predicate logic around the system itself. And, and with abstraction, with suitable abstraction, you can use propositional quite a lot of the time. So we use this because it gives us fast model checking, as you saw in the film. Um, conventional model-based testing, I said that um, learning-based testing is model-based testing without a model. It's not quite accurate in this sense, that if you look at what people do in model-based testing, it's really using only the, the, the next only part in fact, model-based testing is really nothing other than conformance testing. So you have an automata specification, you have an automata model, and you cross-check. Okay, that's really what model-based testing is about, at least in this part of the world. Um, and, and to do that sort of, if you want to express what that is logically, well, you just need, you know, state transitions. And you can code those up using uh, the, the, the X operator only. So you're not using an awful lot of the expressiveness of LTL. There's a heck of a lot more that you can say. You might not need to, but there's a heck of a lot more you can say. So uh, I, I would say that we go beyond um, what's done in model-based testing in terms of requirements modeling. And I think that becomes clear when you realize that in LTL you can talk about liveness. And what can we say about counterexamples to liveness? Time for interaction. A counterexample to a liveness. No? Ah, uh, that might be the symptom. What's the observation? What can you say about the counterexample? It's infinite. Ah, oh, thank you. It's infinite, yes. Infinite. So, how do you work with an infinite counterexample as a test case? Are you really going to feed that through? You can, you can truncate it, of course. And that's what we actually do in the tool. We take a truncation with a certain number of, of, of iterations. And we're very careful there to only issue a warning, OK? And then some model checkers. There are model checkers have different sort of behaviors around the, the counterexample construction here. So um, anyway, in, inside new, new SMD, you get this lasso construction, and we truncate it, and we, we run with that. But you will not find in any testing book that I've ever, ever seen discussions of testing liveness properties for that wretched reason, right? And yet you can study them, right? And, and they're real as problems, right? Absolutely, you can get unfairness in a system. Absolutely. I, I, you can just get an infinite loop. Absolutely, the world's most primitive failure of liveness, right? So, so actually, when you look at what you can express in the logic, you realize that you go a heck of a long way beyond conventional software testing as it's taught in the books. We thought at the time, well, you know, maybe we should inter interface to UML and, and message sequence charts and sequence diagrams. I thought that at one time. I'm not so worried these days. I think just good old-fashioned LTL, as I'm sure pretty... Anyone in the room doesn't know LTL? Great. That 
and allows me to skip some slides and catch up because I'm falling behind a bit. So then you know about things like safety properties. So the great thing about safety properties is that the counterexamples are finite. That's really the definition of safety. And that means you can get a test case that you can indeed execute with no modification or truncation at all, right? Um, so, yeah, you know all about those things, don't you? Liveness. So this is, as I said, where you get a, a departure from um, conventional testing theory. And um, there are certain patterns that are, are quite common in this area. Sometimes, I, I think formulas like this are sort of a bit of a, a crossover because they're, they're kind of live. You know, something good should happen in the next n time units, but, but the n is bounded here. But I, I often i am a bit split whether these are safety or whether they're really aliveness. I know what the technical definition says, but I, but I also know what engineers are, are after when they're talking about these things. So in the reality, there is something gray about about certain kinds of liveness formulas. The counterexamples, I think, are not necessarily infinite. So, um, look up on the modeling side. A DFA is quite clearly far too primitive to model an embedded system because you only have an output alphabet of two symbols. And that will not take you very far in the world. As we've seen a lot this morning, indeed the previous uh, the previous presentation spent a lot of time talking about, you know, predicate modeling for infinite state systems and how, how complex that is. The, the, the real world is basically one has to think of it as infinite state systems. In, uh, in an embedded system, nobody would dare use something like recursion or recursive data structures because of the real-time aspects. So that, you know, the, let's, in, in some sense, the state space is, is bounded, but the data types are, are essentially infinite. So, I mean, I guess what I'm trying to say is that there's not much difference between a finite state system that's really vast, okay, it has 64-bit words, and an infinite state system, right? It, it's really just a, a, a technical, uh, a technical uh, idiosyncrasy that you call it finite state. It behaves as if it was infinite state and has to be really handled like that. So how are we going to sort of fit our automata models to that world? Of course, there's going to be a certain degree of mismatch. Well, this problem is already in evidence in classical testing theory. It's no news to a tester that A, you have to do something like partition testing uh, and B, you're only going to be able to develop a finite test suite, so all you can do is sample on the input side, input side, okay? So on the output space, you have to introduce equivalence classes, and you block up data into its equivalence class. And on the input side, you can only finitely sample anyway, okay? So this has been the reality of, of testing for, you know, 40 or 50 years, whenever one can uh, draw the starting line there. So if you said that to a tester, they would say, yeah, they wouldn't bat an eyelid, okay? It's just life for them. Whereas we, um, yeah, as, as mathematicians, we, you know, start to feel a little bit uncertain and upset about these things. So we're going to work with finite partition sets. Uh, and this is what a tester would do anyway. So a tester might break up the real line into the, you know, the origin and the positive and the negative reals, and one would just do that naturally as a tester and pick certain representative values and push them through the system and just see what happens. And in fact, manual testing can be, you know, perfectly decent in terms of quality results. This might be more than enough to uncover errors. And in general, the brief of the tester is to find errors, okay? It's not to, to, uh, to produce some sort of certificate about error-free. I say it's not. We, we talk a lot about coverage models, and, and then we like to say that, well, you know, I've got 100% line coverage or node coverage or branch coverage, so it's bug-free. This is nonsense, right? It, it's nonsense, but it is what people say socially, and it, it goes so far as to be accepted by certifiers, okay, who are somewhat pragmatic people. So, um, 
So on the input partition, testers already finitely sample, and on the output side, you know, people would again introduce equivalence classes. So what we do in our work is nothing different to what, what testers are doing today manually. And then these partitions, the, the output partitioning then goes into the wrapper. So the wrapper reads off the concrete values and sort of abstracts them back into the symbolic values that will go into the symbolic learner and the symbolic model checker. And then the verdict construction, I've, I've said this before, this verdict construction is on the fly, as you probably noticed in the film. So we get a predicted bad behavior from the model checker. We get an observed behavior from the system under test. And if the prediction is identical to the observation, that's either a fail, if it's a finite test, a finite counterexample, a warning, if it was a truncated infinite counterexample. Otherwise, it's a pass. Okay? If there's no observation at all, which is perfectly possible because you might have just crashed the system under test, then you need to do things like timeout errors and uh, exception handling. So uh, there's quite a lot to be set up to, to be able to make this tool work with just an arbitrary industrial piece of software that you want to uh, uh, test. So a, lo a lot of your uh, problems are sort of very mundane in this world. Does it work? That's what we uh, wanted to do. And, and as I said, we didn't want to build our own benchmark, so we thought, well, let's work with industry as closely as we can over the years and let them throw what the hell they like at us, and we will just try to uh, deal with it as we can. So we're somewhat pragmatic, almost engineering-minded here. So if you, if you integrate these off-the-shelf algorithms in the right way, and you make the right choices, which is a bit strategic, can things be made to work? And it could not work for various reasons. It could not work because the machine learning is too slow or the abstractions are not very good. There's too much mismatch. It could not work because the model checking is too slow or cannot cope with the state space sizes. In fact, I think this is one of the greatest threats at the moment. We're right now more than capable of learning systems that we struggle to model check. So one of the bottlenecks is in this area right now. Equivalence checking is no problem. The other major bottleneck is, sadly, the system under test. If you can only get so much data through a system under test, which happens is, is surprisingly true in industrial software. So the, what we call the latency times, which is the time to process uh, an individual test case from beginning to end, these latencies can be of the order of seconds to minutes. At minutes, I think, this technique is really pretty well dying out. At seconds, we're struggling. We like to be down in the millisecond world. Of course, that's very uh, approachable for real-time and embedded systems. But if you have a server which has sort of order of minutes latency time, this is probably not the way to go today. Okay? You'd have to do other stuff. Because you, as I said earlier, machine, all machine learning that I know of is data hungry. If you cannot get the data throughput, that's kind of the end of the story. We also had questions like, you know, can we get a, a, an automotive company to use LTL? It's not a big issue. It's a misleading issue, in my uh, opinion. And, uh, you know, can you build up pedagogical examples here that you could teach automotive engineers in the future how to work? Where am I? My, how much time do I have left? It's I'm on 22 minutes. So it's time. Here. Is that correct? I think it's time. Okay. Did I make a mistake? Uh, I'll just, I'll skip to, um, am I actually over? Where? Yeah. I'm over. Okay, I'll, I'll just, uh, I've run a bit slow here. I'll just cut very quickly to uh, just one example here. Here's some work we did with a, a master's student at Scania. So Sophia Beckstrom, she knows fairly little about formal methods, nothing about machine learning, and zero about Scania and automotive ECUs. She went out there, she worked with engineers for five months, she had to get hold of these requirements. They are out there in automotive. They, people still have requirements documents today that say things like this, that can be mapped into LTL like this with a since operator. Uh, and she uh, ran the tool. DCS is an individual ECU application. It 
took surprisingly long time to build a 60-state model, which is nothing. On Wednesday, I'll show you uh, models in the, of the order of tens of thousands of states, OK? So uh, this is surprisingly slow. The convergence is good. We almost completely learned this thing. She did, this is a piece of software in production. She found broken requirements. None were safety critical, according to Scania. We injected faults into the same piece of software. We checked out, could their manual test suite find them? And could our test tool find them? So these are 10 different faults. Uh, two are detected by the manual test suite, and all but two are detected by the tool. So I think that's quite a positive result to finish on. There are many more case studies we've done now, and I can point you in, in their direction. So I'm obliged to stop here now. <laughs> and uh, tomorrow I'll talk more about the machine learning side of the story. Thank you very much, Carl. <laughs> Questions? Mm -hmm. um, so the models, so the systems that you analyze, are deterministic? No, not necessarily. Uh, the, uh, there are learning algorithms for deterministic and non-deterministic automata. Non-determinism is a bit more expensive to learn. And the major difficulty there that I see it is being able to provoke the alternative behaviors. Because this is sort of... I mean, the meaning of non-determinism is, is that, you know, it cannot be provoked by the test case itself. There's some other mysterious factor, okay? So, uh, yes? Just if you, if you can answer shortly, otherwise perhaps tomorrow you will talk about. So if you get, um, you get the different uh, passes from a state, do you know whether, it, how do you know whether it is non-determinism or whether your abstraction is too coarse? Um. If you get a different behavior from the, the, the input space is sampled, so that if you get a different behavior for exactly the same test case, this cannot be anything other than non-determinism. It can be because but you abstract. So perhaps you started in, in different states, and then that's why you get the branching behavior. Because you don't have the I, uh, No, but oh, there's a reset. Oh, oh, so maybe there's a reset assumption going here, on here. Uh, that maybe I'll push into tomorrow's talk. One of the things you normally assume with the L star algorithm is that you can reset back to a known state. I see, I see. So you, okay. Yes. Okay. It's quite an important assumption. Um, yes. So about this um, case studies, so what is the 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 system? I mean that the, how you mean that s uh, how to get the model from this? Uh, right. The system is typically a piece of C code uh, running on its own dedicated hardware, and, uh, you know, physical ECU on a board somewhere. Uh, it's a real time piece of C code, so it's it's on a, a loops typically somewhere between ten and say thirty milliseconds. Okay, so it's sampling producing. So it's typically a sample control actuate algorithm of some kind. They're not all necessarily control algorithms in the classical sense of the word. Uh, so you basically, uh, you know, fire in a sequence of data. The EC will read that in. It can be, in a controlled environment, it's done in a synchronous way, okay? So it's synchronously reading in the data. Uh, and then you know the length of the clock cycle which you can deduce timing, uh, and it's producing a sequence of output data, okay? So you have an input, you have a sequence of input vectors, you have a sequence of output vectors, you synthesize the one, you observe the other, you store them, you keep them with a lot of others, you make them all. Yes, yeah, so, but so then you have uh, some kind of like a translation from the C code to the state... Uh, Yes, you can say that. Yeah. Yes. So, Without ever having seen the manual, manual. No, 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 no. Automatic, oh, my word. Yeah. It's automatic. Oh, yeah. Okay. Machine learning means automatic here. 
Ah, okay. So yes. That you didn't if it was talk not about it yet. I'd be out of the door. No, no, no. It's a, the, about this example. That yes. You didn't talk yet me, about how to, to get from the this. Uh, here is a. This is the I think the break by wire example here. This is a, a very very early model, uh, where we have here's the initial state. Okay. So we are, we we have the reset assumption that goes allows us to go back to a known initial state on each test case, okay? Uh, we are able to, you know, read in input vectors. These are certain input vectors here. So we're able to stimulate the system with input vectors, and then we uh, observe it. And if this is quite hard to read, so it's sort of blown up here. So it, in a state, we have, we project out certain critical output vectors. These are normally the ones that are involved in the LTL formula itself. So you don't have to project out all possible variables. So these are the variables that I think involved in the uh, LTL formula that we were talking about, you know, releasing a break earlier on. So th this is the artifact that's synthesized, okay? So it's synthesized by stimulating the system in, in very many different ways and then sort of merging the information together. So essentially the observations can be compiled into a tree, okay? It's often called the prefix tree. And then from the prefix tree, as I'm going to talk about tomorrow, we have to do basically state merging. Okay? And there are different ways to achieve state merging. Any other questions? Um, maybe one. I'm not sure, but um, how do you find um, loopbacks to a previously known state? I'm going to talk about that tomorrow, but we can say. Uh, in a very high level sense, it's a kind of a closed world assumption. So if you cannot show that there's no counterexample to a, uh, a loop, you can assume that there could be a loop. Yeah. Okay. So in this um, scenario, all the um, inputs were tested. There on the left, there's one loop loopback, right? These, uh, no, these loop behaviors one, here. One above there. Um, the second on here, the left. This one? Uh, um, actually, a loop back to a previous, uh, previous node. Right. Um, yeah. Here, there's a there's little loop, yeah. right? Yeah. 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 Um, okay. So we will hear tomorrow. Uh, okay. If you, I think you'll see the answer more clearly tomorrow. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Yes. Um, yeah, very, very interesting. So, in the context of uh, CPS. Um, have you seen there's some recent work uh, that would try to infer uh, hybrid systems models in a similar way using automata learning? Um, are you aware of it? Whose work are you thinking of? Uh, there's some work by Sebastian Fischmeister at Waterloo. Okay, I haven't seen that. It's pretty recent. I've seen some work that's maybe four or five years old on the problem using a restrict, uh, structurally restricted class of automata. And we ourselves looked at the problem about, uh, oh, I don't know, eight years ago, something like that. Uh, and we found it um, very, very data hungry uh, to the point where we didn't, it, it was sort of conceptually possible, but it didn't seem to make a, you know, a realistic and usable algorithm. So I'd be interested to see if the if the paper that you're talking about has uh, improved on that, yeah, it, um, yeah, I can forward it to you. Um, I guess what I'm kind of wondering is uh, how are how is the notion of real time mapped to uh, the program actions? Good question. In in uh, let me go back a few slides. There's a piece of technology here that's really critical, but one would never have known how critical it was, which is this humble thing here, this communication wrapper. This has the job of scheduling inputs and marshalling outputs. And in here, you can build a kind of a synchronous communication link, or you can build an event-driven communication link. The event-driven communication link is very good for keeping the throughput of data down, okay, so that you don't oversample which is possible in some circumstances. On the other hand, if you're interested in hard real-time work, 
Uh, it's very difficult to avoid synchronous communication. I think you basically have to do that. At least that's what we've done so far. So if you build a synchronous connection here, then you know the time interval associated with basically the next operator or one state transition. So that's been our approach. It's been a bit sort of cheap and cheerful. There has been research into uh, inferring timed automata. But again, it tends to suffer from uh, data hungry. It has a problem that we saw in your talk that you now have to infer predicates. And inferring predicates is a, a pretty tough problem in machine learning. We actually, when we did our hybrid automata work, we looked at medial sphere approximations, which I think are even simpler to your ellipsoid model. And we still couldn't get that to scale terribly well at the time. We run into these exponential. We, we actually already have some exponential blow-ups here, but they get much worse when predicates are involved. I think there are now polynomial time uh, learning algorithms for, for timed automata, but they're still not brilliant. It was originally thought to be exponential time. The earliest papers were exponential time. Do you consider any message losses? Yes, and, and I talk on Wednesday, I'm going to talk about that, mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. That, that becomes an issue in something like platooning, mm -hmm. which is something we're quite actively studying right now. Excellent. Any more questions? All right. Thank you very much, Carl.